Our next speakers are Brent Stouffer, Brooke Lyman, Ali Boggs, Samantha Ashmore, all of whom are from the University of Cincinnati. They'll share their talk titled, How Involving Peer Educators in Curriculum Development Improves Their Own Statistical Training in the Process of Helping Their Peers. Okay, Brent. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. I'm excited to be able to hear some of what everyone's been sharing so far. I'm gonna be sharing with you today uh, just how I've been able to involve peer educators in curriculum development in an introductory biology lab course here at the University of Cincinnati. I wanna point out while their names are still on the screen that all four of my co-authors, I, I think I tacked on one at the end last second, um, are in fact peer educators at the undergraduate level involved in the course. So without any of this, uh, without them rather, any of this would certainly not be possible. Um, now I do like to start from the beginning of, of my story and uh, this starts going back to fall 2017. Um, when I was a new faculty member, and, and uh, I, ironically, this was a class that I used to be a graduate student TA for during my PhD, and now I was uh, in charge of overseeing the curriculum and the development of this course. It's a very high enrollment course that serves not only our biology majors, but a lot of other majors from other colleges at the university as well. So we have anywhere from 32 to 47 lab sections of 24 students each per semester. And uh, so it's a very, very high enrollment course. And um, despite the high enrollment, uh, we would often end up with only one or two undergraduate, uh, kind of what I call assistant TAs that would reach out to us on a semester basis, uh, asking to be an undergraduate TA for, for the class. So these sections are actually taught by graduate student TAs or by adjunct faculty. Um, but occasionally there would be undergraduate assistant TAs that would reach out and ask to participate and assist the TAs. Um, what was surprising to me is that, the, again, there were only one to two per semester. So my first impression, uh, kind of to start the story, was uh, I had each of those two um, assist me in two sections that I was actually teaching. And I thought it was such a great positive experience um, that it seemed like a, certainly a room for development to expand that program and to recruit more students to be a part of. So that's kind of part one of the story. Part two of the story is the other thing in the other area that I thought could use the most improvement in for the undergraduate students taking the class was how we kind of dealt with and the resources we provided in the area of data analysis. So this is, again, statistics within the context of a biology lab course, where, of course, they're applying it to the scientific method. But, you know, in my opinion, if we can leave our students five years from the take the class, 10 years from when they take the class, if there's one thing that I want them to still be able to retain, in my opinion, it's their ability to analyze some data and to use those transferable skills of learning how to use Microsoft Excel, make graphs, and tell a story using quantitative data. It's a very powerful skill set, regardless of what they go on to do in their future career. So that's kind of part two of the story is uh, kind of these two main goals that I wanted to somehow accomplish during my first couple of years, improve the peer educator program within this course, and then also improve our undergraduate student understanding of uh, statistics in a biology context. And um, what was interestingly interesting, and I, as I look back and reflect on this, it, it was not intentional, but what ended up be happening as a result of these two main goals is I was able to synergize them uh, kind of unintentionally at times, intentionally in other times, to actually leverage these new peer educators as uh, students who could empower and improve the curriculum with respect to the data analysis curriculum that was being developed. So actually using the peer educator program as a solution to improving the curriculum with respect to the data analysis. So I'm going to talk about different ways and different infrastructure that I uh, used in this program and kind of show you some examples of what some of the students did to help improve these different areas and talk about whether or not these improvements actually worked. So first off, one of the you know, biggest kind of infrastructural supports for especially such a high enrollment class is the personnel themselves. So that's what my main focus is going to be on, talking about how different these different students became involved in different ways. So again, remember, these are undergraduate assistant TAs that are assisting their graduate student TAs or the adjunct faculty in the class. 
eventually we were able to enroll, go from that one to two assistant TAs per semester. to now we have anywhere from 25 to 35 uh, per semester that are participating. With that said, there's lots of different ways that these undergrad assistant TAs are able to get involved. So a good portion of them do just get involved as a volunteer. A good proportion of them also do get do uh, do this for academic credit. So there is a mechanism in our university to for them to enroll in academic credit, get some experiential learning credit for it, get an actual letter grade for it, have it officially appear on their transcript. I also had uh, built into the kind of the framework and the infrastructure kind of head assistant TAs to take advantage of um, making sure, rather making sure there were kind of as, was an intermediate so that if the undergrad ATAs had something they wanted to talk to someone about, but maybe weren't comfortable to me with talk, talking to me that they had an additional resource that they could go to and keep things anonymous if they wanted to. What I also found it to be was a wonderful way to develop the leadership skills of these undergraduate students as well by helping them kind of learn what it was like to organize, what it was like to set up meetings, to develop surveys, to get feedback, et cetera, et cetera. So that's been a great opportunity as well. And then we also have at the University of Cincinnati um, something that many places probably have, and that's a capstone project, a project that they do at the end of their graduating senior year. Um, that involves an oral presentation and written presentation of some shape or form. So those are the different capacities in which ATAs can get involved in our course. At the volunteer level, again, these are just volunteers. So kind of, um, you know, not as much expectations necessarily in terms of what they uh, do. But one of the biggest things that helped me leverage the fact that we have these peer educators in the labs to improve the data analysis skill set was really just holding these weekly ATA meetings. So, so a lot of our focus is of course on holding TA meetings, but I did have a separate meeting for just the undergrad assistant TAs and allowed them to uh, get re-shown how to do some of these skills, but also to practice teaching it to each other. So I'd often have these little uh, sessions where they would kind of role play and have student ATA number one tell ATA number two how to run a statistical analysis of some shape or form but that person wouldn't do anything unless they were told to. So just to practice those communication skills and those guiding question skills and all that sort of thing to, uh, to learn how to run and use the data analysis tool pack in this case. Uh, now for the students doing it for academic credit, however, um, I felt, and certainly there's different opinions on this and that's okay, uh, that if they were going to earn a letter grade for this that was going to appear on their transcript, I wanted to kind of be able to hold something tangible that I could show to someone and say like, ah, well, this is the reason why this ATA got an A for three semesters in a row was because they worked really hard on this resource, this resource, resource. This is proof kind of that they learned something through their process of being a peer educator. And so as a result of that, I decided that if a student was going to do it for academic credit, they needed to develop some sort of resource, maybe conduct a survey, maybe develop an assessment, kind of work on something to help improve the course itself for the sake of better imp or improving the understanding of the students themselves. And what better way to try to help their peers, but by asking, tapping into the knowledge of someone who just took the course not too long ago, right? So it's a really good source of information. Now, because so many students would do this for academic credit, I started to develop an actual like stats team in which their kind of main mission was to improve the students understanding of statistics and kind of had a head stats team ATA as well and a different infrastructure with respect to this kind of team and this uh, hopefully this group mindset that they all had as working together as a team as well. So I'm going to share with you a variety of the different resources that members of the ATA community that did this for academic credit, academic credit worked on. And again, I want to emphasize, yes, this is really great at helping the students learn statistics, but also think about for a second as I flip through each of these, what the ATAs themselves are learning while they're working on creating these materials as well. So I had some ATAs, including Alexander Trion, who worked on actually creating worksheets with different step-by-step -step screenshots of how to conduct 
the different stats analyses. Uh, so we have that now in our digital lab manual as a resource for the students to utilize. There's certainly some students who would prefer to look at a, a screen and at their own pace rather than watch a video on it. So it just kind of really helps that uh, kind of multimodality feature of it. Um, Xander Tree on a different semester worked on a flow chart so uh, uh, what one of the main goals in our lower level introductory course is that at the end of the two semesters, we want them to be able to be handed a set of data and actually be able to decide what type of stats test they need to run on that set of data. And so he created this lab flow or the sorry, this flow chart to help students figure out what type of stats test they might need to run based on the type of data that they're given. So this is a worksheet or sorry, a resource that they have on their table and on Canvas that they can access to help them figure that out. We also on their table kind of uh, had little quick refreshers, kind of quick reminders about some of the different types of tests, what your graph might typically look like for that type of test, what the raw data might be formatted like, et cetera, et cetera. The reason why I wanted to do this and why a particular student thought it was a great idea, ATA thought it was a great idea to do as well, is oftentimes it's been maybe a semester and a half since they ran a t-test last and so sometimes they just need a quick reminder like well what the heck is a t-test compared to a paired t-test etc cetera, etc cetera. and this was hopefully a quick reminder for them to do that i had a student in ata daniel benson who worked on a pre-test and post-test to see if some of the changes we were making helped in the first semester of biology 1081 l i had another ata greta milbrandt who worked on a powerpoint and one of the challenges of doing this sort of improvement for statistics across such a large number of sections is the graduate students that are actually teaching the class have a lot of differences in experiences and comfort levels with statistics as well. So we didn't really have a PowerPoint up until now that the, that the graduate student TAs could use to have kind of a set resource and ability for them to know what they need to cover, what they don't need to cover, uh, what should they focus on the theoretical underpinnings of stats or dig into the mathematics of stats, et cetera, et cetera. So this gave them a lot more guidance. And we still use this every single semester. And this was started and initiated by an undergraduate ATA in our class. We had some ATAs who created surveys. This particular survey was super helpful when I was deciding whether it was going to be worth it or not to build videos. This was pre-pandemic when videos uh, as an online resource weren't super common quite yet. And so this kind of screamed to me like, yes, there's a demand for this. And I would not have been aware that it was such a high demand unless this ATA created the survey. So as a result, I, I created a whole bunch of video tutorials, screen sharing videos that showed them how to actually run the stats test gave them a lot of uh, behind or, you know, kind of looks into Excel and they could watch it at their own pace. That way, if they're at home trying to run their stats test and their TA isn't around, they can still have a resource they can go to. All that to say is now we have all of these resources, but I wanted to see ultimately whether all these resources were actually helping. And that's when the capstone students come in and these are students that we were able to get the, to count as their capstone to do a pedagogical uh, re research project that they could present their results from. And so we, we ended up doing is for each of these different students involved in different years, different semesters, is we created a data exit exam in which the undergrad students taking the course were given a set of data, they were given a scenario, and they were then asked to analyze it, to make a graph from it, to interpret the results, et cetera, et cetera. And for the methodology of this, we had eight different versions of this exit exam, four different uh, types of stats tests, each of which either was significantly different or was not. So that gave us kind of a full factorial design to analyze different elements of whether or not this was actually helping, whether the changes we were making were in fact improving the undergraduate students ability to run these stats tests or to interpret the results, etc. So again, our main goal here was to see if they could identify which stats test it was, whether they could execute it itself in the data analysis tool pack, right? Because there's a difference between identifying the correct stats test and actually executing the stats test properly. 
We also had a variety of parameters that measured uh, their ability to create a, a good graph. And then also how, how did they actually interpret the results? In other words, how did they interpret the p-value with respect to whether they reject or fail to reject their null hypothesis, for example. So we took all of these and for every single category we made, we made it a very simple yes or no. They did it correct or they didn't do it correct. And at the end of the day, our main goal again, was there's all these resources here that the ATAs or myself have used and we created from 2008 to 2009. Then we conducted the data exit exam in 2008 before these resources were present and then have been able to use the data exit exam, sorry, not 2008, 2018, uh, and have been able to use the data exit exam to measure their performance after these resources have been available ever since. So just a quick proof of concept that it's actually all their hard work of the ATAs is actually working and that is actually, and the students are actually benefiting from it. You can see here again, 2018 is before the resources were present. 2019 is the first year that the resources were in play and available for the students. And then I will, uh, of course, acknowledge in 2020 and 2021, these data ex exams were conducted remotely and technically could have been open note, which is which was fine with me because they're using our resources. So that might be why they're a little or they're higher those two particular years. Uh, so there's a little bit of caveat there. But even if you just compare 2018 to 2019, you can see there's significant improvement from year to year. There's also significant variation depending on what sort of the test, test, stats test they gave us, or sorry, they were given. And so that tells us as educators, like, okay, well, what areas do we need to improve? So for example, in 2018, the regression analysis was by far the lowest. And I knew exactly why that was the case, but that actually showed me quantifiably speaking that that was an area we needed to tackle. And so I had ATAs help me tackle specifically the regression analysis. And you can see that there is in fact a dramatic improvement on their score from 2018 to 2019 in the regression analysis area. So hopefully this is a little proof of concept that all the hard work of the ATAs did in fact pay off. And then ultimately what I hope to also emphasize here is at the end of the day, the students got to get some powerful insight as to learning how other students learn and also think about how they themselves can learn some of this as well. And at the very least, they also got a lot of these transferable skills of making graphs, analyzing the data, organizing data sets, et cetera, et cetera, got kind of reinforced by taking these pedagogical projects and grading other undergraduate students in these areas as well. Um, one of the best uh, kind of qualitative uh, data, in my opinion, that we can get is to see some one of the ATAs actually acknowledge that by taking part in this pedagogical project that she said she grew past a lot of her imposter syndrome. So if, if we can accomplish that somehow by getting them involved in pedagogical improvement in some shape or form, I think that's a huge win. And she's gonna go on and feel hopefully more confident in taking part of other research projects and activities along the way as well. So in conclusion, certainly we've got this nice established peer education program now with some kind of pur purpose and focus involved in different ways. A lot of these improvements certainly wouldn't be possible without these ATAs. So it's a really powerful team that we've been able to develop here. And then certainly I would love to at some point you know, so we got quantitative support for the undergraduate students. We've got qualitative support that the, that the ATAs themselves are benefiting. It'd be great to start to be able to quantify to what extent the ATAs are benefiting as well. So with that, I'd like to, again, acknowledge the Army of ATAs, also the graduate student TAs and adjuncts, because they had to buy into a lot of this along the way as well. Um, so certainly appreciate all of them involved over the, the years as well. So if there is time left, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions and uh, certainly thank you all for, for listening. Thank you so much, Brent. Um, we do have one question from Frank. I think we only have about a minute. Um, but did UTAs take the exit exams, and so you can, so you can show that, show that. Sorry, Frank. I'm totally butchering your question. Did the UTAs take the exit exams, um, so you can show 
basically show them themselves that they increase in ability after teaching? Yeah, so that that's a great question, Frank. And um, no, I haven't. And then I started to ask myself, because I asked myself this question like earlier today, and I started to ask myself, why not? Like, why I haven't I done that? And the, part of the reality is uh, these ATAs are often helping me with the grading of these exit exams. So they're, they're, they're lit literally given the answer keys for these exit exams. So it, it would be wonderful data to have. And, and there's probably a better way to design a very similar approach. And um, so that will be on the forefront of my mind moving forward. Uh, but that's the, the, the quick answer to that. that Thanks so great. much, Brent. That was great. Thank you. It's 325. So um, that is the end of this uh, segment. Thank you, Brent.